Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Garden and Landscape webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about pest control in your garden and landscape. And I'm calling this part one because as I was creating this webinar, I realized that there's so much to talk about when we talk about pests in our landscape. So today we're going to concentrate on insects and then part two, which is going to be in, in two weeks, we're going to talk about diseases and some other pests in our landscape. So pest management in the landscape, what does that include? That includes the control of weeds, diseases, insects, and nematodes. So you can see here in the photos here, we have a lot of weeds, we have a viral disease over here on a rose. This, these are thrips down here, and this is what a root knot nematode does to the roots of your plants. So all pretty devastating to plants. But we need to make sure that we mention that pest management does not include nutrient deficiencies, water imbalances, whether too much or too little, uh, water, mechanical injuries uh, such as hail damage like you see on that tomato plant there or the tomato fruit actually uh, or uh, what I like to call weed whacker blight or string trimmer blight when uh, uh, the, the landscape guy gets a little too close to the tree and, and can girdle the tree. Uh, climatic effects like you see on that that tree over here that's a lightning strike that happen, uh, could be cold damage if you're in parts of the country that has cold, uh, and also just improper care. Maybe we planted the plant too deep, we planted it too shallow, we're not watering it enough, and not fertilizing. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, plants can decline. It's not always a pest-related issue. So when we control pests, we like to practice a uh, something that's called integrated pest management. That's the technique that we like to use. We, we call it IPM for short, in integrated pest management. Now, what is integrated pest management? Integrated pest management is a sustainable approach that combines cultural, biological, physical, and chemical controls for acceptable pest management that minimize, minimizes the environmental, health, and economic risks. So basically what we want to do is we want to control the pests to either save uh, uh, to save our vegetable garden, to save our landscape garden from damage from the pests, but we want to do it in a safe manner. So we want to use the least toxic ways to control the pests first. Uh, if that helps, and if that doesn't work, then we slowly move up to, um, to different measures to controlling the pests. And I want to mention that diversity really helps with, with pest management. If you think about a landscape, probably a lot of you have a lot of different plants in your landscapes, and that's great. That's what you want. When we have that monoculture in a landscape or a monoculture in a vegetable gardening where we're growing all the same plant, that is just a smorgasbord of food for that, that insect or that disease. You can just imagine an insect comes along and their favorite plant is tomatoes and you have six feet of tomato plants, it, they're just gonna go to town. Now, if you mix your tomato plant in with maybe a zucchini or other plants and you kind of, kind of diversify your garden or device, diversify your landscape, then there, it's harder for the bug to find, the insect to find that particular plant. A great example is a community that I worked with uh, in Central Florida, and they had a lot of palm trees on their property. They had 700 queen palms. Well, there's a disease going around queen palms called fusarium wilt disease. Well, one of the palm trees got that disease and it spread through pruning. So you can imagine it was pruning day and their landscapers are out there pruning their palm trees. Uh, and it spread on the pruning tools and before long all 700 palm trees had that disease. So they, if they diversified and added more different types of palm trees rather than just queen palms in their landscape, they probably would have had such a loss as they did that particular day. But pest management includes good cultural practices. So if you have been attending any of my presentations over the past month or two, you know we really stress the right plant for the right place. So this is finding the right environment for the plant you wanna grow. 
and making sure that it's planted properly. So if you have sun, make sure the plant that you're planting in the sun likes sun. If you have shade, make sure that plant likes shade. If you have a very dry area, make sure that plant can sustain in drought or dry locations. So finding the right, plate for the right plant for the right place is very important because the plant's gonna be healthier if it's happier. If you have pest prone plants, uh, replace it with something that's not, that's pest resistant. Uh, for example, there are crepe myrtles trees that can get a disease called powdery mildew, but there are certain cultivars of crepe myrtles that are resistant to powdery mildew. So that would be an example of choosing a cultivar that's resistant to a certain disease. Or if it's just a pest prone plant, we're going to talk about oleanders today. Uh, oleanders, if you have an oleander in your landscape, it's most likely you're going to get the oleander caterpillar on your plant. If it's something that, if that's a pest that you don't want to be fighting every year, then I suggest removing that, that oleander plant because every year it seems like that, that insect comes and devours your plant. It might be improving the plant environment. So hopefully with the right plant for the right place, you found the perfect environment for that plant, but sometimes things change. Uh, oak trees will grow and start shading out plants that were once in the sun and they start to struggle a little bit. Or maybe an oak tree falls down and where plants were once in the shade and, and doing great, they're now exposed to the full sun, which they don't like. So sometimes it's just improving the, the plant environment and finding the right plant, right place for that plant again. We always want to water and fertilize appropriately. Insects love when we overwater and over fertilize our plants. When we overwater and over fertilize our plants, sometimes have a tendency to grow very quickly. And when they grow quickly, their new growth is very vulnerable to these pests because it's very thin growth. It's very uh, succulent growth that it has a lot of uh, yummy juices in it that the insects like, and they're going to come in and feed uh, on that new growth. So we want to make sure we water right and fertilize right, but not overdo it. So these are the integrated pest management or IPM concepts that you're gonna practice in your landscape or garden. The first one is monitoring or scouting. This is important. So you're gonna go out to your landscape or out to your garden and you're gonna look around on a regular basis. Look for a discoloration of the plant or look for signs and symptoms that an insect or disease is present. Um, if you ever heard of that, the uh, phrase out of sight, out of mind, yeah, sometimes that happens. If we forget to check on our landscape or check on our, our garden for a week or two, we go out there, these insects can move fast. They can take over pretty quickly. And I get calls all the time that says, this insect just ate my plant overnight. Well, usually it doesn't happen overnight, but uh, this is just making sure that we want to visit our landscape on a regular basis so we can catch problems early. Uh, we talked about the oleander plant and the, uh, the oleander caterpillar. These are key plants and key pests. Some plants are prone to certain pests, and we're going to talk more about that. And also some pests are prone to eat certain plants. Uh, we're going to talk about action thresholds. When do we take control and, or need to take control of an insect? And what intervention methods do we do to do that? Um, but again, integrated pest management re starts with proper cultural practices. So what we talked about in the slide prior. So again, monitoring, that's regular inspections that help detect our plant problems earlier. Like I said, if we can catch pests earlier, they're much easier to control with in, in, instead of having a huge infestation of, of insects to control. You know, a few bugs here and there are easier than hundreds uh, a week later. So what do we look for when we monitor or we scout for insects? One thing you want to look for is chewing damage. Chewing damage is done by caterpillars, beetles, grasshoppers. Uh, they're, they're all going to come out there and, and chew holes into the plants. So you can see the, the plant on the left has uh, holes or chewing marks around the edges of the plant. That's done most likely by a caterpillar, but it could also have been a beetle or a grasshopper doing that. And then the one on the right is also a caterpillar, but it's an immature caterpillar. So a little small caterpillar made it just hatched out from the egg. It doesn't quite have the, the mouth parts or the mandibles to chew full holes into the plant. So it just starts chewing along on the, the leaf tissue, uh, causing what we call a skeletonizing uh, effect. Leaves some, it leaves some of the tissue behind. 
Other things that we want to look for are piercing sucking damage. So these are our piercing sucking soft bodied insects such as aphids, spider mice, lace bugs, mealybugs. Uh, what they do is they don't chew holes into the plants, but they have a straw like mouth part, which they insert in typically into the new growth of the plant and they suck the juices out of the plant or out of the leaves. And when they do that, they can cause the leaves to become distorted like you see on that photo on the right. They can also cause the leaves to become discolored like you see the stippling effect caused by the lace bug on the azalea on the left or the stippling effect that you see caused by the spider mite. So what the insects are doing is they're sucking out that chlorophyll that causes the green in the plants and they, they leave behind that discoloration. And they also suck out the, all the, all those juices can cause that, that, uh, that damaging effect like you see the curling or the couple, coupling uh, on, the, on the right. You may also wanna look for excrement. Uh, or droppings from the insects. So all those piercing sucking insects that we talked about, uh, the aphids, the mealybugs, the um, scale insects, and also the white flies, they excrete a sticky sub substance called honeydew. So as they feed on the, the, the juices out of the new plant, they excrete this honeydew. On the honeydew, which is sticky, grows a a fungus called sooty mold. Now this is a non-pathogenic fungus, which means the fungus actually doesn't cause any harm to the plant, but it's a sign that you have a piercing sucking insect. So if you see that black stuff on leaves, like you see in that bottom photo there, and if you scrape at it, it scrapes away pretty easily with your fingernail or with a hose, that's a sign that you have a piercing sucking insect causing damage. But the black sooty, sooty mold does not cause any problem uh, to your plant, except it just kind of looks bad because it has that, that black flaky stuff on the plant. You may also see other excrement such as droppings. Caterpillars have frass and they leave all that frass behind uh, on the leaves. As you can see in that photo on the left, that caterpillar is eating away and they eat all the time. So that means they excrete all the time. So they're always leaving stuff behind. And then the specks that you see over on the right, that's caused, caused um, by some lace bugs. Uh, lace bugs, their, their droppings look kind of like oil spots. They're really shiny uh, that they leave on, on the leaves. So I did mention key plants. Some plants uh, have a high incidence of pest problems due the, just to the inherent accessibility or mismanagement. Uh, so it's just, sometimes it's just that plant's going to always get that certain insect. Uh, so there's a couple options you can do. You can always keep an eye out for that insect and can, can control it as you see it, or don't plant that plant at all. Uh, for example, here's a rose. Everybody loves their rose plants, but some rose, roses are susceptible to black spot disease, and some roses are susceptible to the chili thrips. So that if you don't want to be fighting the chili thrips or the black spot, maybe the rose bush is not for you, or maybe getting a cultivar of roses that are least susceptible to those to those diseases and insects. Uh, here's uh, some what the damage of the chili thrips uh, on the rose looks like. You can see they they have rasping mouth parts and they kind of they kind of chew away at the at the leaf blade, causing that discoloration. So a key pest is an organism that is frequently encountered in the landscape and predictably causes injury to key plants. So again, chili thrips like roses. Oleander caterpillar likes oleanders. Uh, aphids like crepe myrtles. So there's certain pests that are key, key pests that are associated with key plants. Um, and that helps with identification of problems a lot of times when we're talking about pest management. If you can identify the plant, then we can easily or easier identify the problem because a lot of plants have certain problems that are associated with them. So here we have some other uh, key pests and key plants. Here's T-scale that it's a uh, we're going to talk more about scale, but it's a stationary insect uh, that's always seemed to be found on the camellia. There's those beautiful oleander caterpillars. They look pretty, but they love to eat all the leaves off of your oleander. And then if you have a, uh, a sago palm in your landscape, 
they typically get the Asian CICAD scale. So let's talk about some common pests that you might see in the landscape. We mentioned aphids before, and aphids are probably one of the most common ones that you're going to see in the vegetable garden and also that you're going to see in the landscape. So aphids look like little pears. So you can see they have a pear-shaped uh, body, and it's hard to see on this photo here, but they, they have these two uh, cornicles that stick out of their, their backside there. That's a great identification for the, for the aphids. Now these aphids you see here are kind of a green color, but they come in all different colors. They can be red, green, yellow, brown, black, and there's even blue aphids. So uh, all different colors as far as the aphids go. And there's different aphids for different plants. Some aphids are more generalist, which they'll feed on a variety of, a plant, of plants, but then some aphids are, are specific feeders and only feed on specific uh, plants. So as they start to feed, if you see down here on this hibiscus plant, they cause the leaves to become, become distorted or, or, or cupped. Uh, they, you can see the growth is very deformed. Um, and sometimes you might see their shed skins. If you look closely on this bottom picture here and also on the top picture, uh, there's some white specks. That's their shed skins that you'll see. And then the sooty mold, which you'll see on the bottom picture here, that black uh, substance, that's the sooty mold we talked about that grows on their excrement or the honeydew. Uh, that's a sign that you have, have a, some type of piercing sucking insect. And in this case, it's the, it's the aphid. The next one is the mealybug. Uh, the mealybug, again, it comes in, uh, there's different types of mealybugs for different plants. Uh, this is some, so this one has a more of a yellow tinge. There are some that have more of a pink tinge to them, but mealybugs are, are mostly generalist. They can get on a lot of different plants. You can see they like to congregate all together and they have this white filament that's associated with them. And then they also have that sooty mold. You can see the sooty mold that's growing uh, on these plants here that's growing on the honeydew that they excreted. And I, I should say that with uh, the aphids and even with the mealybugs, they like to hide on the plants. So this one here, you can see it on the stem, but a lot of times they're, they're underneath the leaf of the plant, they're hiding from their predators, or they might be in the bud of a new uh, flower. So you gotta, gotta really look closely for these insects because sometimes they can hide from you. The next is scale. There's hundreds of different types of scale insects. Scale insects are primarily stationary insects. As you can see in this diagram here, uh, they, they crawl for a little bit of the life and then they're, they're gonna find that perfect place to settle down or hunker down. And they remind me kind of like a turtle. So they have a shell and then in the shell is the, is the insect and they have a, a straw-like mouth part part or needle-like mouth part and they stick that into the leaf and they just sit there and they suck out all the juices of the leaf. Uh, so you can see here we have the wax scale uh, which um, you can see the young and the mature as they grow. Over here we have some Florida red scale and we have some T scale. Now scales can be either soft scales or armored scales. With the soft scales, you're gonna get the sooty mold. So the soft scale is gonna excrete the honeydew and on that honeydew grows that black sooty mold. The armored scales don't produce the honeydew and the sooty mold. Uh, but uh, they, these are, you can tell if it's an armored or soft scale by just touching them. Don't be afraid to touch these insects. They're not gonna hurt you, but the soft scale, if you touch it, it's gonna smush very easily and you're gonna have, you might have some scale guts come out. Uh, the armored ones, it's gonna take a little more pressure to to uh, squish them. It's going to feel uh, like a hard, hard structure on top of them. Uh, the armored scares, scales are going to be much harder to control than the soft scales because any type of insecticide that we use is going to be harder, obviously, to penetrate the armored scales versus the soft tissue on the, on the soft scales. So the next common insect you might see in your landscape are the thrips. Uh, thrips come in uh, different colors also. There's black and brown. This is a translucent yellow chili thrips. And the chili thrips and all the other thrips, they can feed on the leaves. They can also feed on the flowers. You can see the damage that they've done here to the flower by feeding on it. Sometimes they'll get into the flower buds and they'll pre prevent your flower bud from even opening. 
Uh, that's what they do. And they have a rasping mouth part. So their mouth part, part what, it, what they do is they, they kind of plane the leaf, kind of like a wood plane does, where it peels up the first layer of a piece of wood. They'll do that with their mouth part, and then they'll lap up the juices that, that come out from that. And that's where you get that discoloration that you see here. Uh, to easily test for thrips, take a white sheet of paper and then take your plant and just shake it on top of that white piece of paper. And then you'll see the thrips come out if you have thrips. Uh, or if you have a flower bud that's not opening, just take that flower bud, cut that off and try to open it up and shake it and see if any thrips come out. Then the next one, this is a pretty common, especially down here in South Florida, are the white flies. Um, probably about eight or 10 years ago, there was a infestation of a new species of white clogs called white fly called the spiraling white fly and it was devastating a lot of the ficus uh, shrubs down here a lot of the ficus hedges that people had um, but it was quickly quickly controlled with with some insecticides but it's called a white fly it's not related to a house fly or other flies but it's called a white fly because the adults are white and they do fly and then these are the immatures or the nymphs that you see here they're kind of a translucent color so you gotta look, sometimes look really closely under the, the underside of the leaves to find these insects. Uh, usually you find them from the discoloration because they have a piercing sucking mouth part, the straw-like mouth part, they suck the juices out of the leaves. They also will cre create that honeydew and, and you'll see the sooty mold that's associated with the white fly. Um, but they're, they're very hard to see when they're young. You can see even the small, this more uh, immature, the really young here, uh, very translucent. Uh, but usually you find them when you bump into the plant sometimes and you see these white bugs then flying around. And then also we have our caterpillars. Oh, there's a lot of different caterpillars that can cause havoc on our landscape and in our vegetable garden. And probably the number one is, uh, that you'll see a lot is that tomato hornworm. Even it's called a tomato hornworm. You'll see it on tomatoes, but you'll see it throughout your garden and throughout your landscape. I've seen these guys on just about anything. And they're, they look scary and they get really big. They can get probably about three to four inches in, in length. They, um, but they don't, they don't bite and they don't hurt you. Even though they look scary with this horn on, the, on their backside, they're not going to uh, bite you. Um, uh, you can easily pick them off and get rid of them. Uh, this is the, the palm leaf skeletonizer that occurs on palms. So when a palm leaf is folded up before it, uh, it opens up, sometimes that caterpillar can get in and just, just eat the, the first few layers of the leaf and they leave behind some of the tissue. That's why it's called a skeletonizer. It's mostly uh, aesthetic problems. It doesn't cause any real problem to the palm tree. Uh, and we talked about the oleander caterpillar that uh, loves the oleanders. Uh, fall webworms are cyclical. You'll see them now and then uh, in your trees, especially in the forests. As you walk through the forest, you might see them up in the trees. Sometimes they drop down from the tree. Um, this little inchworm guy here, the snowbush fanworm, I had an issue with him in one of our demonstration gardens once. I saw these beautiful white and black moths flying around the landscape one day, and I said, well, aren't those pretty? I didn't know what they were at that time. And then a few days later, I noticed that our snow bush had no leaves. And I looked closer and found these little span worms eating them. And it was the snow bush caterpillar from those beautiful black and white moths that were flying around. So we could cho have chosen to treat for the caterpillar, but being that it's, it was such a huge infestation that we were fighting uh, week after week, we just decided to take the snow bush out. So that might be one thing that you decide if you're a low maintenance garden, gardener like myself, you know, some of these pest prone uh, plants, they just don't, don't do well in my landscape where in others that if you have more time or don't mind treating for the, the plants or treating for the insects, then you'll be okay with that. And I guess it depends on how much you love that plant. And then we have the bagworms. These are really cool. Whoops, I lost you. These are really cool um, at, Caterpillars here, they, they create this little cocoon for themselves out of the sticks and leaves that are on your plant. And sometimes you'll see him stick his head out here or her, she'll stick her head out here and, and, and crawl out. And um, these are usually, uh, they're not a huge problem. They can defoliate some plants, but they're, they're usually not a huge problem in the landscape. Oh, grasshoppers can be huge problems uh, in our landscape and in our vegetable garden, especially the lovers. 
Uh, if you're if you're in, in Florida or anywhere in the country that gets the lubber grasshoppers, then you know what I'm talking about. They start out so small and cute little grasshoppers, and then they just grow into these gigantic grasshoppers. And grasshoppers are generalists. That means they eat just about anything. So you're going to find them all over the place. And they like to live and hide and in uh, like tall grasses and tall plants. So you might, that's why they call it obviously a grasshopper. Um, but you can see the damage they do on the crinum lily here. And the easiest way to get rid of them, uh, of course, when they're little. Uh, with all insects, when they're in their young stages, that's easier to con control them. Um, usually it's hard to spray for uh, grasshoppers because they jump and fly. Um, but if you have a bucket of soapy water around, you can just take those insects that you find or catch and just throw them into that bucket of soapy water and, and drown them that way. And then finally, one of the most common insects that we can find is the spider mites. So spider mites are actually arachnids. So they aren't an insect at all. They're actually a spider. They have eight legs and they can create a spider web just like regular spiders do. They're, they're really tiny. Here's the two-spotted spider mite that, that's probably the most common that you're going to see on plants. And they can get on your inside plants as well as your garden and landscape plants. And so they'll create these webs when you have a severe infestation, and that helps them get from, from leaf to leaf. And they also have shed skins, uh, you can see in the webbing here. And they'll cause that discoloration uh, as they suck the juices out of the leaf uh, that you see here. So those are some of the common insects that we have. Now, I want to talk about some of the action, uh, the action threshold. So the threshold is when do we take control of the insects? Because a few insects in your garden, a few insects in your landscape is fine. We don't want to completely eradicate every insect out of our landscape and garden. We need to leave some, some guys there to, for the beneficial insects to eat. Um, but there's, sometimes there becomes a level that they start causing damage. So maybe damage to your vegetable plants, so you're not getting any produce from your plant, or it might be damage to your landscape plants that aesthetically they start to look bad. That's when you're going to want to take action. So remember, we want to practice integrated pest management uh, when we take action. So we need to think, how are we going to manage the pests? Can we simply just physically remove them? So with those caterpillars, yeah, that's probably the easiest to do is physically just remove them to pick them up. Um, and throw them in a bucket of soapy water. Some of my uh, master gardeners might take their pruners and, and, and control them that way. Uh, do we, can we rely on biological controls? You might be able to rely on biological controls such as the ladybugs or the uh, green lace wings. Or do we have to chemically treat them? And that's a possibility too. You might have to chemically treat them with either a organic pesticide or an inorganic pesticide. So first, let's talk about physical control. So here you can see uh, they're just picking that caterpillar right off of the plant, and that's the easiest way to do it. Um, you just pick it off, like I said, throw it in a bucket of soapy water, step on them, uh, cut them in half, whatever you can do to, to get rid of that bug. If you don't want to kill them, you, you can just slowly kill them, put them in a, a plastic bag and close that bag up. Uh, if you have grubs in your in your lawn, these little spikes, aren't they, aren't they neat? That's a way you can stop around your, gra your uh, grass and get rid of those grubs that could be causing damage in your, in your lawn. So that would be called physical control. Uh, here we have that oleander caterpillar. Look how beautiful that moth is. So remember that oleander caterpillar was that orange caterpillar with the black tufts of hair coming out of it. Um, but this is what the be beautiful moth looks like. So if you see this moth flying around your oleander, guess what she's doing? She's laying eggs. So part of the physical control if you have an oleander is if you start seeing these eggs on the leaves, if you see her laying her eggs, just pick that one leaf off. You're gonna, there's at least 20 eggs there that you, can, that you can eliminate right away. Or if you see the little eggs hatching out, you can just pick that one leaf off before these little caterpillars get any bigger. Uh, here's, some, here's when they get even a little bigger. So when they're smaller, they're much easier to control uh, than when they get, when they get larger uh, and they're all over your plant. Uh, here's when maybe you can get them when they're in a pupa stage before they turn into, into adults and start flying around and laying more eggs. Another reason, another way to practice integrated pest management as far as um, controlling it through 
um, through physical methods is pruning out prone, uh, pest prone limbs of the plant. And you can see here, this is, uh, looks like it is a uh, viburnum plant, or I'm sorry, a ligustrum plant. And the ligustrum, if you look closely, they notice the, the sooty mold. Oh, look, there's black sooty mold on this plant. That's a sign that I have a piercing sucking insect, a soft bodied insect. Maybe it was aphids, scale, mealybugs. Looking a little closer, they turn over the leaves. Oh, they're scale insects. How do we know that scale insects? Well, they're, they're not moving. They're stationary for most of their life. So they're feeding on that leaf there. They're excreting the honeydew and they cause that black sooty mold to grow on the top of the leaf. So it looks like it's confined to only one stem here. So what's the easiest way to do to get rid of this scale is just cut off that one stem and then you're done, you're good. Uh, so that's the one way to physically remove some insects too. So another, the second way after physical intervention is biological. You know, we have some good guys out in our landscape and out in our vegetable gardens that are doing the work for us. So these are natural pest control or natural predators, parasitoids and pathogens that we have. So the predators are include ladybugs, lacewings, spiders, long-legged flies, ground beetles. So they're the ones that are gonna go and they're going to eat another insect, they're, they're a predator. So they're gonna actually seek them out and attack them that way. Then we have parasitoids. Par parasitoids, we have a parasitic wasp and there's a lot of parasitic, parasitoid flies also. They actually will lay their eggs inside a insect uh, and, that in, and they will parasitize that, that insect. And then pathogens are good fungi and good bacteria and even good nematodes that will attack us. Uh, so there's some diseases out there will, that will attack some of our bad insects. So first let's talk about the lady uh, beetle or the, the ladybug, some people will call it. Uh, this is one, ladybugs come in all different colors and shapes also. So this is uh, one of the ladybugs and this is the immature ladybug. It looks quite different from the adult. So the immature reminds me of almost like a little alligator, um, but with six legs. And this guy will eat just as many aphids and white fly and mealybugs as the adult will. So if you see a funny looking insect like this crawling around your aphid infested plant, just know that they're doing a good job for you. So here's, a, here's another ladybug. This is probably the most common ladybug that you're used to. And you can see the larva here. So the larva, again, looks like a little alligator as far as this uh, ladybug go, goes, and then it pupates into the adult. So the aphids and the, and the mites, they love, or the, I'm sorry, the ladybugs love to eat aphids, they love to eat mites, spider mites, scales, mealybugs, thrips, white flies, caterpillars, grubs, just about anything. So you wanna encourage the ladybugs to come to your yard, and we'll talk about that in a second. I don't recommend buying ladybugs from the store, uh, the ladybugs that you typically buy from the garden centers are from California. That's a different species than the ones that we have here in, in Florida. And they don't do well in Florida. They're not used to the humidity and the heat of Florida. They're used to the mountains of California. And so when you let, when you release them out into your, your landscape or into your garden, the first thing they want to do is fly back west, fly back to California. So we recommend encouraging ladybugs to come into your landscape with other means. And I'll, I'll share that in a couple of slides. But first, I want to show you the green lacewing. This is another cool looking insect. You can see the larva also looks like a little uh, alligator. And here it is, is picking up an aphid and just they pierce it and then they just basically just suck out all the juices uh, out of that that bug. Uh, this is the adult, very pretty. You can see why it's called a lace wing. Her, her wings are very lacy. And these are the eggs. Aren't they kind of neat? They're on like little pins. So you might see that in some of your out in the garden. So if you see that, know that, that those eggs are actually good insect eggs out there. So the green lace wing likes to eat aphids. They'll eat eggs of insects. They'll also eat scales, mealybugs, and mites. And this guy here, the trash bug, that's a, another type of green lace wing. So this is the larva of another, another, cult, another um, species. And then there's the brown lace wing, very similar to the green lace wing. Uh, it just looks a little different. Instead of being green, of course, it's brown. But it eats just the same amount of uh, is bad insects that the green lace wing does. Aphids, insect eggs, scales, mealybugs, mites. 
Now I will say you can actually purchase the green and brown lace wings uh, to release in your garden. Those are, those are insects that I would recommend buying and releasing into your garden. Um, not the ladybugs, but I would, but you can uh, buy these and they will stick around. Then we have the surfeit or the hoverflies. So another type of beneficial insect you might see around in your landscape. They look like bees or wasps, but um, this is what the larva looks like. And that's the one that's actually doing uh, the, the, the good on the bad insects. So they're actually eating the bad insects. The adults are just kind of like butterflies where they just consume nectar uh, and they act as pollinators. It's the larva that, that loves to eat those aphids. Uh, this is the minute pirate bug. Uh, this one loves the, to feed on white fly larvae. So these are white fly larvae here. You can see where it just takes its mouth part, just sticks it into that bug and just, just uh, drinks out all the, all the uh, body fluid from that insect. And then here's a parasitic wasp. There's a lot of different parasitic wasps out there. They're not like a wasp like you think of a paper wasp that's going to come out and sting you. Uh, these are very tiny. They're about the size of a gnat. Uh, so you might not even see them in your landscape since they're so small, but you'll probably see the work that they do. So up top we have a parasitic wasp here that she's laying her egg into a caterpillar. And as you can see here, these are the caterpillar cocoons. So they're actually feeding off of that caterpillar, slowly killing it. So if you see a caterpillar with these funny little cocoons on their backside, don't kill it. Let it complete, let the parasitic wasps complete their life cycle so you have more that go out into your landscape and kill more caterpillars. Parasitic wasps will also lay their eggs in aphids and white fly. Here we have what we call mummy aphids. So this one, these were once live aphids and a parasitic wasp came along and she laid her egg inside the aphid. That egg hatched. The the basically a maggot of the is going uh, consumes the inside of the aphid and then eventually emerges out of the aphid after it completes its life cycle and turns into an adult parasitic wasps. So you can see these exit holes on the back side of the aphids. That's where that par that adult parasitic wasp came emerged out of the aphid after it completed its life cycle. So if you see these on your plant, blown up aphids with holes in their backside, you know you have parasitic wasps in your landscape and or in your garden, you can rely on them for doing some of the work for you. So here's a closer up picture of it. Um, you can see these guys have been parasitized. They're starting to blow up or swell. Here's, here's the parasitic wasp. And then this is one that where the parasitic wasp has completed its life cycle and exited out of that aphid. So you might have some mummy aphids with some live aphids going around. And you might even, if you look close, you might even see the parasitic wasp there doing the job for you. Here's, here's a parasitic wasp on white fly. If you look closely, you can see all these holes on the white fly larva. So again, that's where the parasitic wasp emerged out as an adult. And here she is depositing her egg into the aphid. Here's the adult coming out of the aphid, you know, kind of like the, like an alien type of a scenario, but pretty, pretty cool in the, the world of nature. Now I know there's a lot of people out there that don't like spiders, but spiders are good to have in your landscape. They love to eat the insects. So wolf spiders, they're very common in Florida. You've probably seen those. Sometimes they get inside, you know, when they get inside, then we want to, we want to kill them or get them back outside, but they are going to be very beneficial in your landscape. And the green lynx spider is another one that loves to live in your, your landscape. So uh, we really only have two uh, poisonous spiders in Florida. We have the brown widow and the black widow. And you're not going to find those in your garden. They like to live in, sometimes I found them a lot in the corner of my garage. Uh, sometimes you'll find them in wood piles or underneath picnic tables. They're not going to actually be in your garden. So keep an eye out for the red and the, the brown widow and the black widow. And if you see them, then those, you, of course, you want to destroy. But other, other um, spiders in your landscape, leave them alone because they're doing good work for you. So if you remember how I talked about, we want to try to invite these good bugs into our landscape. And this, we can do so by creating banker plants. So banker plants are plants that have a specific insect that will come feed on it and an insect that does not feed anywhere else in the lands or on any other plants except for specific plants and one example is the crepe myrtle and the crepe myrtle aphids so the crepe myrtle aphid is a specific 
aphid just to crepe myrtles. It doesn't feed on any other plant in your landscape. So you can actually have crepe myrtles in your landscape and allow the aphids to feed on it and to devour it. And maybe it's kind of like a sacrificial plant. You don't care what it looks like because you're just basically using it as an insectary or nursery uh, to invite those ladybugs in, to invite the green lace wings in. And hopefully when they're feeding on the aphids that are on the crepe myrtle, they'll go to the other plants in your landscape and feed them more aphids and more white fly and, and more scale insects. So it's, so it's kind of like a, a nursery for the, the ladybugs and the other good bugs out there. Uh, so you're not gonna spray the banker plant, you're gonna let the aphids devour it. Um, another example would be papaya. There's a papaya white fly. Uh, so you could have papaya in your landscape that you sacrifice to the papaya white fly, trying to invite in those ladybugs, trying to invite in those green lace wings to come in and feed on the plant. So if the if your physical intervention doesn't work, or if your if the uh, biological intervention doesn't work, you might have to move to chemical control. So we want to use pesticides as the last resort. Now with pesticides, I want to mention that we have insecticides, fungicides, bactericides, rodenticides. There's a lot of uh, pesticides within the pesticide category. So today when we concentrated more on insects, we're going to talk about insecticides. Um, but we, again, it should be your last resort. The first, res the first thing you're going to do is tr culturally try to keep your plants happy by planting them in the right place and giving them the right amount of water and nutrients. Um, then you're going to try to pick off or physically remove any insects. Uh, third, you're going to try to bring in the biological control for the insects. And yes, your last resort is going to be the use of pesticides. The reason why we want to be at the last resort is that we want to be aware of any non-target organisms that might be out there. So we want to protect those ladybugs and those green lace wings. So just uh, remember they are insects too. So they are going to be, uh, can be affected by using pesticides, whether they're organic or inorganic in, in the garden. So we're going to talk about the least toxic or bioirrational pesticides first. That's going to be your first choice. And we always spot treat. We don't just go out into our landscape and spray everything with an insecticide because it's probably never going to happen that your entire landscape is going to be affected by a certain insect. Um, again, most insects are host specific. They only attack certain plants. It's very rare that all your plants are going to ever die from one insect in your landscape. And we're, then we're going to talk about how to minimize our insect resistance. If we can if we continually use insecticides in our landscape, our, in, our insects can build up a resistance so that they eventually aren't killed by the use of pesticides. So again, here's our little ladybug. We want to make sure that we don't, we don't kill them with pesticides. So they are, um, they definitely are an insect, so they can be they can be killed with insecticides. So just be careful before you just go ahead and gra and grab the insecticide. Make sure you inspect to see if you have any ladybugs that are working that day that are out there eating for you. Because you know, any a ladybug can eat fifty aphids a day. Um, and also, don't kill everything because if we kill every single aphid or every single single white fly or every insect in our landscape, what are these guys are going to have to eat? What are they going to eat? They're going to starve. They need to have some insects to eat. So we don't want to starve out our good guys either. So these are some of our bio-rational pesticides. These are ones that are considered organic and they're considered least toxic uh, chemicals. And I want to say that I don't endorse any of these brands. They're just used as examples um, of available products for your homeowners. So there's a lot of different brands out there. We have insecticidal soaps. We have horticultural oils. Uh, neem oil is an extract from the neem tree, uh, which is actually an insecticide and a fungicide. And then we have BT. So insecticidal soaps, um, these uh, and the oils work great on your uh, soft bodied insects. So these can be used on your aphids and your white fly um, and, and the scale insects and all the insects that we talked about today can be affected by the soaps and the oils. Uh, you, they are contact killers, which means that you have to have contact with the insect in order to kill them. So for example, if you have aphids and aphids like to hide under the bottom of the leaf, you need to make sure that you're spraying the bottom of the leaf so you can have contact with that actual insect with the soap or the oil. Um, be careful when you use oils because oils, a lot of them you cannot use when temperatures are above 85 degrees because that can be harmful to your plant. So you want to make sure that you read the pesticide label to make sure you're applying it properly. 
Um, uh, like I said, neem oil, same way. You don't want to use it when it's too hot out, but neem oil is an insecticide and also a fungicide. And then BT or Bacillus thuringiensis, this, this uh, chemical only kills caterpillars. It doesn't kill any other organism on the face of the earth, but caterpillars. So this one would be safe to use uh, in your landscape if you're controlling the, um, the tomato hornworm or if you're, if you're controlling the oleander caterpillar or the snowbush caterpillar. Um, and it won't kill the ladybugs. It won't kill the green lace wings. It won't kill the parasitic wasps. It only kills caterpillars. But just remember it kills caterpillars. So do not use this in any of your butterfly gardens because butterfly gardens have larva plants which caterpillars feed off. So it will kill those too. It doesn't know the difference between good caterpillars and bad caterpillars. And you can find these at, at many garden centers. And then also with the bioirrational pesticides, we have synthetic pesticides. These are also low toxic pesticides, um, but they're not, a, they're not considered organic. These are considered um, synthetic pesticides. Again, I don't endorse any of these uh, products, but some of them include uh, bifenthrin, uh, malathion, and imidacloprid. Uh, and uh, you really need to make sure that you read the label of your pesticide and make sure you're using them on uh, the location that, or the plant, they're allowed to be used on the plant that you want to use on, use them on. For example, if you look at malathion and malathion and imidacloprid, malathion there says that you can use it on your vegetable crops where imidacloprid, that particular uh, formula right there is only for landscape plants. It's something that you would not use on your vegetable plants. So always read the label, make sure that you're using it in, on the right plant. That's very important. Uh, imidacloprid, uh, malathion and bifenthrin are contact killers. Imidacloprid is a systemic, which means that it goes into the system of your plant and kills the insects as they feed on that plant. Uh, so like I said, um, always read the label. So you want to read the pesticide label when you buy the, before you buy it, when you buy it, before you mix it, before you use it, you want to always be reading that label. That label is the only way that manufacturer has to, to communicate with you on how to use their product. So the first thing, like I said, make sure where and on what it can be used. So if you're using a pesticide, whether it be insecticidal soap, horticultural oil, whether it be organic or synthetic, make sure it's labeled for where you want to use it. So if it's for your uh, vegetable garden, make sure it can be, it's labeled that it can be used on vegetables. If it's for your landscape, make sure it's labeled that it can be used, used, used on landscape. You don't uh, want to use turf grass pesticide on your shrubs and trees. Uh, you don't want to use shrub and trees on your turf grass unless it says it can be used on both. So make sure you always get the right pesticide. Um, always read the, has read the hazards to humans, pets, and the environment. Uh, it's really good practice not to spray any pesticide, whether it be organic or not, uh, or not organic, whether it be soap, oil, or synthetic pesticide when your flowers are in bloom and when the bees are out. Um, so if the bees are working your flowering plants, don't spray a pesticide because they're insects. They can be um, affected by that pesticide. So don't spray anything that's in bloom so we can uh, save the bees. Also wear your personal protective equipment. I'm sure everybody is used to hearing that nowadays with PPE or personal protective equipment. It will tell you on the label what to wear. It will say to wear gloves, closed-toed shoes, pants, uh, long sleeves, maybe goggles. Each pesticide is a little different on what you have to wear to protect yourself, but it's really important to protect yourself when you're using the pesticides, even if it's considered organic. Organic is not always considered safe to use. Always follow the mixing and application directions. Uh, it's not a good practice to use more than what's directed. So if one tablespoon is good, don't think that two tablespoons is better. Uh, you want to make sure you follow the, the directions precisely. Uh, the, again, the manufacturer is going to tell you how to use the product properly. They don't, they're not going to tell you how to use it improperly because they want your, you, you have a good effects by using their products. And also, if you are spraying it on an edible plant, whether it be your vegetable garden or a tr uh, fruit tree, make sure you read the days to harvest. Some will say, do not apply 10 days before harvest. So if, you're, if your tomatoes are ready to be picked and the pesticide says it needs 10 days before you can actually pick those tomatoes once you spray it, choose not to use that pesticide at that time. Make sure you keep a calendar so you know when it's safe to pick and eat your edible after you use that pesticide. Again, whether it's organic or non-organic. And then always uh, store and dispose of your pesticide containers properly. 
So I mentioned a little bit about insect resistance. This just shows you that if we continuously use the same product over and over and over again on the same pest, they can build up a little bit of a resistance uh, to the effect that eventually that pesticide that you choose to use, the insecticide that you choose to use will not kill that pest, that pest anymore. So if you use a soap one time, maybe try an oil the next time. So always mix up uh, your, your chemicals so you, can, so you can kind of keep the insects guessing on, on how, you're, how you're gonna kill them. So in review, uh, use go good cultural practices. Remember a happy plant can fight off insects and disease more than a, uh, a stressed plant. Know what your key plants and key pests are. If you don't know what your plants are in your landscape, make sure you identify them because that can help us with pests that can happen now or in the future. If we can identify our plant, that saves a lot of problems with knowing what, that, what insects or pests can affect that plant. Always go out into your garden and landscape frequently, maybe every week, every other week, and look at, your, look at the plants and scout for any problems. Remember, it's easier to catch the problem when they are young and when it's a new problem, whether whether uh, instead of it being an infestation. Uh, make sure you establish your tolerance thresholds. How many insects can be on this plant before it cause, causes economical or aesthetic damage to your plant? Remember, we don't want to have a, we don't want to eradicate everything out in our landscape because pests are, some pests are okay to have. And then once you uh, pass that threshold level, how are you going to intervene? Uh, are you going to use physical controls, biological controls, or chemical controls? And help spread the word about integrated pest management. We, we need you, and we need the public, and we need the master gardeners to help spread the word that, that most organisms in our yards are not pests. Less than 1% of all insects in the world actually cause harm to us, to our homes, to our plants, to our pets. So most of the insects out there just coexist with us or they're beneficial. Uh, make sure that we don't practice bad cultural uh, practices. So make sure that we're watering appropriately, fertilizing appropriately, and we don't want to spray pestic pesticides just because it's time to spray a pesticide. Remember I said that most pesticides are contact killers. It actually has to have contact with that pest in order to kill it. So just going out into, because it's Monday and spraying a pesticide out in your landscape is not going to kill the pest if you don't have a pest problem. You can't prevent them with most of the products that are on the market for homeowners right now. Uh, I mean, we want a balance of the good and bad guys. So there's good guys out there, there's bad guys out there. Leave some of the bad for the good guys to eat so they can keep coming around to your landscape. If you need to hire a, pro a professional pesticide company, we always stress, make sure they're licensed. It is required by law to have a license to spray a pesticide uh, commercially uh, for hire. Also, it's, uh, you also need to have a, a fertilizer license to apply fertilizer uh, for hire. Uh, make sure they practice integrated pest management. I see commercials on TV all the time about companies that are doing that. They say they don't just come out and spray because it's that time to start spraying uh, on your contract. They come out and they actually inspect and they actually look for pests. And if they see pests, that's when they will spray. Um, so be willing to pay for the expertise versus just routine pesticide applications. Um, I will take some questions now, but before I take the questions, I do want to always end this program uh, like I always do by letting you know if you have any gardening questions, insect questions, landscape questions, contact the Martin County Master Gardeners Help Desk. You can email or give them a call. Um, if you aren't in Martin County, you can contact your local extension service, what, wh whatever county or state that you are in. Uh, make sure you're following us on Facebook because that's where you're going to get the, the most up-to-date information on the programs that we're, having, we're offering. And then, of course, our EDIS uh, website, the electronic database for information source, edis.ifis.ufl.edu is a great resource. Uh, you can um, type in their pest control services and there's a whole publication that tells you how to buy pesticide services, what questions that you're supposed to ask. Um, I am not, unable to do a, a presentation next week. So in two weeks, we're actually gonna have part two of pest management in the garden and landscape. And we're gonna talk about plant diseases. So let me see what questions you have. And I hope that everybody uh, tunes in again in two weeks. Let me open up the chat box. We have a few questions here. Um, the one question was about, can they use alcohol on young plants to get rid of aphids? Um, I want to I want to really stress that um, the University of Florida does not recommend the use of home remedies. Um, the reason is that um, products like 
uh, rubbing alcohol or making your own soap solution, there's not a pesticide label on that product. So we don't, you don't, we, it, there's no way, you don't know what personal protective equipment you need to wear. You don't know how much to use. You don't know how much to use is going to damage your plants. So we actually don't recommend any, any use of home remedies um, as far as that goes. Um, there's a question, is the bagworm the cloth-like insect frequently see on the outside of wall? Yes, actually the bagworm, you sometimes you'll see them on the wall and sometimes you'll see the plaster worm, which is very similar to the bagworm that looks like a little, it's the shape of a watermelon seed. That can sometimes be on the outside of your wall that's it's making its cocoon out of the stucco or the plaster that's on your house. So you could see bagworms on your wall too. Does the parasitic wasp kill monarch caterpillars? Yes, they can. So parasitic wasps will kill any caterpillar, unfortunately. So you might see them around your butterfly garden. Uh, so hopefully there's a good balance. Um, you know, let them have some, but then that you have some. I know uh, a lot of my master gardeners who try to grow butterflies will actually take their caterpillars and put them in a butterfly cage to keep them from pet predators. Uh, Cause those little lizards will also eat your caterpillars. Um, Carrie asked if we have brown recluse spiders here. Actually, we do not. Uh, if you find a brown recluse, it's a hitchhiker, probably on a package or inside a box or some type of shipping that came in by accident. Brown recluses sometimes are found here, but they're not, they cannot establish colonies here in Florida. So again, if they come here, it's by accident if you see a brown recluse. A lot of times people will get uh, MRSA and they'll confuse that with a recluse bite. Uh, so in, unless you actually see the spider biting you, it it's probably wasn't a, a recluse spider. A uh, question from Barbara is one of her, her, her hibiscus plants drops its buds flowers almost as soon as it develops and she can't feeding, see feed, anything feeding on it. I'm thinking it might be thrips. Yeah, I think it might be thrips. So what I would do is um, take a bu flower bud and opening it up and, on a white piece of paper and try to shake it out and see if you see any thrips on there. Um, those are really hard to control with the thrips. You might have to use the systemic insecticide, which you put on the roots of the plant and the plant takes up that chemical and, and takes it to all parts of the plant um, and kill them that way, just because they're, they're kind of protected when they're inside that flower bud. Um, but that would be my best guess as far as what's happening with your hibiscus. So, um, Diane was saying there's a whack out weeds that is a, a herbicide that she found had been very successful on torpedo grass. And that's good to know. Torpedo grass is an invasive species here uh, in Florida, and it's really hard to control in your landscape. Um, so again, that's great. That's an herbicide. Make sure all, you're always following the label uh, that to use that. Yeah, and Wendy said that Josette uses uh, monarch cages to raise her, her, uh, her caterpillars so they aren't susceptible to the um, the, the uh, parasitic wasp or those little li lizards eating it. So as always, I thank you for joining. We're just at about an hour, so we're a little over uh, time. Usually I like to keep these about 45 minutes, but um, hopefully I'll see you in two weeks when we talk about plant diseases in the landscape. Again, I really thank you for tuning in today and, and have a great one. Take care, everybody.